To succeed in aviation, many pioneer designers and pilots relied upon family members for more than just moral support. The Wright brothers inherited their practical skills from their mother and commandeered their sister to travel with them on several business trips. Glenn Curtis, when starting his airplane company, relied on his wife for her business skills. And Amelia Earhart completed many record-breaking flights with help from her wealthy husband, George Putnam. However, the Stinsons from small town Fort Payne, Alabama, outdid all of these pioneers in making aviation a truly family affair. In February of 1891, Catherine Stinson was born in Fort Payne to Edward and Emma Stinson. In July of 1893, Brother Edward was born, an almost spitting image of his father pictured here. In July of 1896, Sister Marjorie was born, also in Fort Payne. A fourth child, Jack, was born in December of 1900. In 1912, after a plane ride with a pilot named Jimmy Ward, Catherine became interested in aviation. She soon went to Kinlock Field in St. Louis, Missouri, where she flew with the pilot Tony Janus. In May, she moved to Chicago, Illinois, and started taking lessons at the nearby Cicero Flying Field. On July 19, 1912, she passed her pilot's tests. A few days later, she received license number 148 from the Aero Club of America, making her only the fourth U.S. woman to earn a pilot's license. In 1913, Catherine and her mother created an aviation corporation, and then bought a Wright Model B flyer for Catherine to use in airplane exhibitions. She began her exhibition career in Cheyenne, Wyoming, billing herself as the flying schoolgirl. In July, she performed at Coney Island Park in Cincinnati, Ohio. At this point in her career, she was careful to do only controlled flying, such as mild dives or landings at a specific spot. From August until the end of her flying season, she then exhibited her flying skills in Arkansas, in Montana, then in Texas, again in Arkansas, in Arizona, again in Texas, and then in Louisiana. While in Helena, Montana, Catherine became the first woman to fly the U.S. mail. In 1914, Marjorie started flight training. At age 18, she enrolled in the Wright Brothers Aviation School in Dayton, Ohio. She soloed on August 4th and received a pilot's license on August 12th becoming only the ninth American woman to do so. 1914 was a busy year for Catherine also. She flew in Texas, in Kentucky, in Illinois, in Minnesota, then in North Dakota, in Kansas, in Colorado, again in Illinois, in Michigan, and in California. She capped her 1914 flights by appearing with Sister Marjorie in Nashville, Tennessee, where they raised funds for that city's Equal Suffrage League. More than a decade before Amelia Earhart started campaigning for women's rights. Catherine also decided that this was the year in which to attempt her first Loop the Loop. Her Wright Model B could not provide the power and safety needed for such a feat, so she asked the Partridge Keller Airplane Company in Chicago to build her a tractor-style airplane. The new plane was ready in July, and she practiced acrobatic maneuvers, including looping, in nearby Cicero. Over the next few months, Catherine flew in Michigan, in Arizona, and then in California. In San Francisco and in Los Angeles, she flew at night, making her one of the first American women to do so. By the end of 1915, she had become a national flying sensation. In January of 1916, Catherine, Eddie, and Marjorie started leasing land from the city of San Antonio, Texas, property that they developed as the Stinson School of Flying. Catherine and Marjorie served as flight instructors. 
Although Eddie also had earned his wings, he served as lead mechanic. Because of the increasing need for Allied pilots for the world war now raging in Europe, Marjorie began training pilots for the Royal Canadian Flying Corps. In June of 1916, Catherine flew in western Canada, including the cities of Calgary, of Edmonton, and of Winnipeg. On November 25th, along with her mother, Catherine boarded a ship at San Francisco and steamed for Japan. On December 15th, she made a night flight over Tokyo, performing loops, sky riding, and other aviation feats. She then performed in Yokohama, Nagasaki, Osaka, and Nagoya. Catherine won over the Japanese establishment by dressing more than once in a traditional kimono. But her aviation feat suggested the more radical idea that women should have the same life opportunities that men do. In China, Catherine's aviation feats stunned audiences there just as they had done in Japan. Thinking that her airplane could rise vertically into the air, many Chinese at first crowded around it, making takeoffs and landings difficult. Nevertheless, the flyer traveled widely in China, performing in Beijing, in Canton, in Hong Kong, in Nanking, and in Shanghai. In April of 1917, the United States entered World War I. A month later, Catherine and her mother steamed back to the safety of U.S. shores. Within just a few weeks of her arrival, she had raised over two million dollars in pledges for the American Red Cross. Back in November 1916, another woman pilot, Ruth Law, had set a long-distance flight record of 590 miles surpassing one set by a male flyer. Although Law and Stinson were friends, Catherine was determined to break the new record. In December 1917, she did just that, flying from San Diego to San Francisco, a distance of 610 miles in 9 hours and 10 minutes. Meanwhile, Eddie had entered the U.S. Army and started training military pilots at the new Kelly Field in San Antonio. In June of 1918, Catherine set a flight duration record of 10 hours, 10 minutes, by flying from Chicago to New York. In July, she became the first person, man or woman, to fly air mail for the Canadian government. In September, she became the first woman air mail pilot for the U.S. Post Office. In light of her many flying skills and successes, Catherine twice applied to become an Allied fighter pilot, but the U.S. Army refused her service both times. In the waning months of World War I, she still found a way to serve her country by driving ambulances in France. The stress of wartime service led to Catherine's contracting influenza and then tuberculosis. She returned to the United States and later moved to the dry climate of Santa Fe, New Mexico, where she entered Sun Mount Sanitarium. While there, she met John Gaw Meem, a major southwestern architect. While Catherine regained her strength, Meem trained her to become an architect. In 1920, Eddie, along with younger brother Jack, started the Stinson Aeroplane Company. In 1921, Eddie and co-pilot Lloyd Bertaud took off from Roosevelt Field, Long Island, circled the overhead skies for 26 hours and 19 minutes, and then landed back at Roosevelt Field, capturing the world record for the longest flight duration. In 1922, Eddie became a test pilot for the Stout Engineering Company. In 1925, with William A. Mara and other investors, he started the Stinson Airplane Syndicate. This company developed airplanes of superior quality and sold them to leading aviators and or companies. Buyers included World War I flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker, the founders of Northwest Airways, and Paul Braniff, co-founder of Braniff Airways. In 1928, Eddie set another flight duration record, this time 53 hours and 30 minutes. 
In 1932, however, his good fortune ran out. While he attempted a landing in a Stinson Model R on January 25th, his plane struck a tall flagpole and crashed. His injuries were so severe that he died early the next day. According to the Associated Press, by the time he died, Stinson had flown nearly 1.5 million miles in his career. He is buried in Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in Southfield, Michigan. The end of World War I essentially ended Marjorie's flight training career. She barnstormed at fairs and exhibitions until 1928. In 1930, she became a draftswoman for the Aeronautical Division of the U.S. Navy. She retired in 1945 and died in 1975. Her ashes were scattered over Stinson Municipal Airport in San Antonio on July 27, 1976. Back in 1928, Catherine had married Miguel Otero, Jr., who was himself an aviator and the son of a New Mexico territorial governor. She spent her latter years working as an architect in Santa Fe. She designed and remodeled private homes and designed other buildings in the Pueblo Revival style. She became ill again in 1959 and by 1962 was confined to bed. She died on July 8, 1977, at age 86. She is buried next to her husband in Santa Fe National Cemetery.